Welcome once again, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. I hope you all are doing well, as uh, just mentioned. And everybody who's joining online, I hope you're following along with the course well. Uh, so good, good, good. Uh, Karan, you have your hands raised. I think that's by accident or or do you want to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> all right, no problem. That's right, okay. Hey, can I request one of us to start us off with a word of prayer, please? Yeah, anybody, just uh, please lead us in a word of prayer. Sure, I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before the throne of grace. We need your mercy, Lord, for your grace and mercy today, Father. We love you, we praise you, Father, as we spend time in the class of learning about the worship ministry. Father, we thank you for the subject. We pray, Father, let deeper insight, the revelation from the word of God. I speak the spontaneous revelations from God in Jesus' name, Father. Thank you, Dad. Night, Pastor, with your divine wisdom. Father, you are the author of the Bible, and you will your word with the divine Rema word, O Lord, we thank you, we praise you, Father, for your goodness. Your goodness overflows in our life, Dad. As we pray, we spend the time, Father, let Spirit of God work in our hearts, work in our soul, Father. Let we understand more deep, Father, your heart and, and your, your heart, O Daddy. We thank you, we praise you, Father. Give us the wisdom understand, to understand the deeper things of the word of God. We thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right, guys, let's uh, get started. Um, so last week, we uh, started off our, on our journey on uh, learning from the tabernacle of Moses, right? Um, so we started off there. Uh, just, just quickly do a quick uh, recap. Uh, okay, from page 16 in your notes, from page 16 in your notes, uh, that's where we started our journey. Uh, into the tabernacle of Moses, um, we see that how uh, how the tabernacle was God's idea. It was His sanctuary. It was His dwelling place. Uh, from the time of the fall in Genesis to Exodus twenty-five, that's about two thousand five hundred years. There was really no dwelling place uh, after the fall. After Adam and Eve had sinned. Uh, there was a separation, a great divide between divinity and humanity, and how the tabernacle was a bridge, um, you know, between heaven and earth. Uh, and um, so, and so, the one of the first things that we encounter as we go into the tabernacle is the gate, uh, which we call it as the place of introduction. Right at the gate, you meet Jesus in all his four offices, uh, as he is presented in the four gospels. Right, he's presented as a king. He's presented as a son of God. He's presented as a pure and perfect man, uh, and he's also presented as our savior in all of those four gospels. Um, and the four gospels, uh, um, the four colors of curtains or the veil that makes up uh, the gate represents Jesus in his all his four offices. That is the place of introduction, right? And then which leads us into the outer court, as we all know. In outer court, there are two pieces of furniture, isn't it? Um, so there's a brazen altar or bronze altar, or also known as the altar of sacrifice, uh, which we call it as the place of reconciliation. The place of the altar is a symbol of the cross, right? Where Jesus is, uh, Jesus gave himself as a perfect sacrifice for us. It is at the cross where reconciliation is born because he shed his blood for us. And he took our place on the cross. He reconciled our relationship with God the Father back because of what Jesus did on the cross. Um, so that is a symbol, that's the imagery 
uh, of the brazen altar. It's a place of reconciliation. Uh, it's also a place where it reminds us to offer ourselves up as a living sacrifices every day. Okay, it's not just a place where we encounter and know that what Jesus did for us, but it's also encouraging us, urging us to live a life of a spiritual sacrifice, to offer your body and your life as a living sacrifice um, completely to God, okay? Um, and then from there, we move to the next piece of furniture, which is the bronze laver or the brazen laver, uh, which is a place of sanctification. In page 18 uh, in your notes, page 18 in your notes, we see that uh, it was like a big, tub a uh, water basin right on the outside it was covered with bronze and on the inside uh, of the tub uh, basin it was filled with mirrors that was used by women right and we see that it's a place of sanctification because uh, in the tabernacle days the priests had to wash their hands and their feet before they entered the holy place right before they enter the holy place they had to wash their hands and feet now the hands it symbolizes works deeds right now we we don't have to wash our hands in a sense right it's again metaphorically speaking because we don't live by deeds we don't because we live by grace okay jesus is our righteousness right uh, we are in him and he is in us uh, so we don't have to you know, worry about deeds. Our works are, is not going to get us to heaven. It is the righteousness of God that covers us. However, we still have to walk this walk of life. We still, our spirit and soul is still in this body. That means we still have to live this life. And uh, that means you are in the flesh and flesh is capable of committing every acts of sin. You still have the capacity to commit murder. We still have the capacity to lie. We still have the capacity to gossip. We still have the capacity to examples, right? All these acts of sins. And so, which is why we need to sanctify ourselves on a daily basis. And, and from what we read in your notes, we see that word of God cleanses us. His word cleanses us, right? And we are also cleansed and empowered by the spirit like we read in Titus 3, uh, right? And then also in James chapter 1, verse 22 and 25, we see that the word of God is, um, is used as, uh, it says that it's a mirror for us, right? It's a mirror that tells us, okay, what is good, what is not good. Um, if a man looks at himself in the mirror and if he doesn't correct himself, he is a fool. Uh, but if, if, if a man looks at himself in the mirror and corrects himself, he is a wise man. And it's amazing how James uses God's word as a mirror. And funnily enough, that the basin on the inside was made of mirrors. Uh, and that's just, a, that's just wonderful, isn't it? Um, so the bronze laver is the place of sanctification. We are cleansed. We are, uh, we are made whole by God's word. Okay, so that's the outer court. And then the, now we enter into the inner court. As you entered in to the inner court to your right side, there was a table of showbread or shoe bread. That is the place of satisfaction. Okay, uh, the bread resembles Jesus as he is the bread of life. He satisfies us. He provides for us. Okay, give us this day our daily bread. Right, um, so he's he's uh, he. Uh, that is a place of satisfaction and and, and a reminder that Jesus uh, is the bread of life because that's what he says in John six thirty five. I am the bread of life, and John six fifty one fifty eight. Uh, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Right, uh, and then we concluded last week with. Uh, this uh, other piece of furniture, which is the golden lamp stand, uh, which is a place of illumination, right? In John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, right? Um, that's, um, that's another symbolization there. Uh, John chapter 8, right? Yes, John chapter 8. Okay. okay. Um, so it was a place of uh, illumination. It's a place of revelation. 
Uh, and one of the key scriptures that we uh, we kind of concluded was from, I think, Second Corinthians chapter 4, that Paul writes about Jesus as the light of the knowledge uh, of, of the face of God, of the glory of the face of God that we all need. Um, so, yeah, the, so we concluded that. And I hope, uh, you know, we're all doing well until then. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. Because today we'll continue uh, in your notes and on page 20. And this is the last piece of furniture in the holy place. Okay, so in the holy place, you have the table of showbread, you have the golden lampstand, and then you have the altar of intercession. Okay, the golden altar of incense. This is a place of intercession. Okay. Um, let me just read the verse that's there in the notes from Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 to 9. It says, You shall make an altar to burn incense. Okay, uh, guys, I hope everybody uh, has your notes ready. Should I share the screen? Will that be better? Will it be better if I share the screen? I think I'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Yeah. Okay, so give it a second. Done. Okay. All right. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, we are page 20, uh, just, for, just for all our reference sake. Great, so Exodus 30, uh, verse one to nine. Can I request uh, one of us to read this, this passage, please? Anybody, please read this passage. Siddharth, uh, do you mind reading us this passage? Yeah, yes. I mean, the whole thing, just the notes. Yes, the notes. Yeah, whatever is there from Exodus chapter 30, 1 to 9. Yeah. Just okay. the first uh, uh, You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and cubit its width. It shall be square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of piece with it and you shall overlay its top its sides all around and its horns with pure gold and you shall make it for it molding of gold all around two gold rings shall make it okay under the molding on both sides you shall place them on its two sides and they will be holded for the poles with which to bear it you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where i will meet with you Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps he shall burn incense on it and when aaron lights the lamps at twilight he shall burn incense on it uh pre perpetual incense okay, before sure. the lord Yep. Incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it, or burn offering, or grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you so much. Okay. So there's uh, clear instructions on uh, how the altar is to be built. Now, there was clear instructions for every piece of furniture that was ever built in the tabernacle. Okay. Uh, we are not going into the details of it. Um, but it, it's wonderful to see that how God is very specific about the details, uh, which wood to use once again, as always, um, and how many rings and everything sh uh, to go in this. Okay. So, uh, in later on, when you read in Exodus 30, 34 to 38, you see that this incense was a mixture of uh, four rich and uh, very rare spices. 
okay um and this was used to uh, on uh to be burnt on the altar of incense okay um so i mean that altar of incense uh, on it you cannot do any burnt offerings uh, you cannot or any drink offering or grain offering that was not the altar for it it was just purely an altar for incense okay uh, let's uh, just read just a few more scriptures um can i uh, just request us to uh, go to leviticus chapter i just pa paste these uh scriptures that i would like for us to read in the chat section um It'd be wonderful if you could help me read those scriptures. Um, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 13. Numbers chapter 16, verse 46. And Numbers chapter 7, verse 86. Okay, can three of us, uh, any three of y'all, uh, read those uh, scriptures, please? Leviticus 6, 13. Anybody? Correct. Please go ahead. Yes. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Okay. So that is uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 13. Is that correct, Prince? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so uh, just to, um, I, I think I, just for all our benefit, I'll paste that verse also. Um, this is the NIV version. This is Leviticus 6. Sorry, guys. That's not, not one. Okay, so he used to put the incense on the fire before the Lord. That means this altar of incense was just before the Holy of Holies, right? The only thing that separated the Holy of Holies and the holy place uh, was like a, a thick six-inch veil, okay? Uh, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. Um, one of the interesting things, um, uh, wait, let me see if there's another version of it um, that we can, okay, this is of the same verse, but the NLT version, it says, uh, there in the Lord's presence, he will put the incense on the burning coals so that the cloud of incense will rise over the ark's cover, the place of atonement that rests on the ark of the covenant. If he follows these instructions, he will not die, right? So um, Im imagine this imagery, okay? So, and this incense was to be burning in the morning and in the evening throughout the day, right? As it's mentioned. That means the holy place will, will always have this smoke in it, this, uh, in, this fragrance of, uh, you know, of the incense filling that room and 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 you know, and it could go past the veil, and fill uh, the mercy seat as well as we read in Leviticus uh, sixteen thirteen. Um, now, can I request uh, somebody else to read the next verse, which is Numbers sixteen forty six, please? And Moses said to Aaron, "Take your fire pan, put live coal from the altar in it, and incense on the coal, and hurry with it to to the people of to the people in perfume." and purification for them. Holy Lord Anger has already broken up and 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 an epidemic has already begun. Correct. Yeah. So this is another different context, but uh, Moses is commanding Aaron to do the same thing: is to uh, burn uh, the incense on the altar. Okay. Um, so uh, again. Now, in that context, there was the wrath of God that was coming, but then that altar of incense, pouring the incense, was like a place of intercession and, you know, standing in the gap and asking God not to do that. Because that's what intercession simply means, isn't it, guys? Right? Intercession simply means standing in the gap. 
right? In the past a year and a half or almost two years, um, how many times have we said to each other, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Uh, you know, I will be praying for you. Uh, you know, you are in my prayers. Yeah, have you done that? That more so, I mean, I'm sure we've done that a lot in our lives, but then, uh, I mean, at least in my life, it seems like I've said that a lot more in the last two years, year and a half th during the pandemic. Um, you know, so simply every time we say that, you're, you're telling the other person, I am standing in the gap for you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to intercede for you. And we just saw that context, uh, you know, in Numbers chapters, uh, what is that verse? Number 16, okay. Um, there's another uh, chapter that, a verse, uh, like uh, I'll read for us, is Numbers chapter seven, verse 86. It says, the 12 gold dishes filled with incense weighed 10 shekels each according to the sanctuary shekel. Altogether, the gold dishes weighed 120 shekels. Okay. Uh, now, there was these dishes, uh, gold dishes, okay, and it was all filled with incense. Uh, that was, and I would encourage you to read that entire chapter, uh, you know, because again, the details uh, that, mo that, that the scripture goes into, that God goes into, is amazing. Um, so I would urge you all to just read, go through those. Uh, passage of scriptures, those entire chapters, um, you know, for, for better understanding. We can't do that now for time's sake, okay? Um, all right. Um, so at the altar of incense, uh, in your notes, uh, is where intercession begins, uh, where the word becomes our prayer, okay? Uh, let's go to Psalm 141, verse 2. It's one of the go-to passages every time we mention um, intercession, okay? Psalm 141, verse 2. And uh, with your hand in that scripture, let's, we'll also turn to Revelation uh, chapter 8. Sorry, sir, my mistake. <laughs> no problem, sir. It at least tells me that the class is alive. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So we have Psalm 141 and Revelation 8 ready. Okay. So let's read uh, Psalm 141. Uh, I'll read one, 1 and 2. Okay. It says, O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. Verse 2. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Okay, you see how prayer is uh, used as uh, an imagery for incense, right? May my prayer be set before you like incense. And may the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Such a beautiful imagery, isn't it? David was such an amazing poet, you know, uh, poem writer, a poet, I should say. Right? Um, now let's quickly go to Revelation chapter 8. Uh, and I'll read the first three verses, okay? The first four verses, just so we understand the context. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. Remember, you know, just pause. It says... This angel was holding a golden censer. Where did we read about it just now? In number 16, didn't it? Number 16, 46, right? And uh, sorry, number 7, 86, okay? Their golden uh, vessels were filled with incense. So the same thing is mentioned here. Another angel was who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer 
with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Where? On the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Okay, um, so th that's just another uh, beautiful, beautiful imagery. So this altar of incense is an altar of intercession, right? Um, and we see that Jesus also intercedes for us uh, in heaven. He's constantly uh, interceding for us. And uh, in the one of the key verses is it starts in John chapter 17, verse 1. Okay, John chapter 17, verse 1, when, he's, uh, when he lifted up his eyes to the heavens and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Right? And in that whole chapter, in John chapter 17, we see that Jesus interceding for his own. Right? Uh, and he still does it. Uh, and that intercession, that his, his intercession for us is like a fragrant cloud of incense before the Father, right? Covering the faults and the sins of the people of God so that they will not be destroyed by the wrath of God, right? Um, so that is, uh, that's something beautiful about the altar of intercession. Uh, okay. From here, now we move to the Holy of Holies. Okay, now, in the outer courts, there was noise. There were people, you know, uh, there, was, there, was, there was a crowd of people, right? Every time this crowd of people, there, there's, there's some kind of noise, right? There's, uh, there was crying. Um, there was, there was a, there's a sound of greetings. There's a sound of a sacrifice, a washing, everything. But in the Holy of Holies, you experience Psalm 46, verse 10 which is, be still and know that I am God. Okay, there's a transition happening here, guys. From the outer courts to the inner courts, to the Holy of Holies. Right? The outer and the inner courts uh, very much involve our duties as Christians, the things that we have to do, uh, our ministry, uh, you know, our worship leading, our pastoral ministries, etc., etc. Right? The outer and the inner courts kind of uh, symbolizes our duties as a Christian, right? what we need to do to move into places where we really want to be is the place called the Holy of Holies. And that's where we really want to be. Okay, um, so past the veil, on the Day of Atonement, once a year, once a year, every, every year, the high priest, only the high priest, okay, would go into the Holy of Holies and, and put the blood um, on the mercy seat as an atonement for the entire nation of Israel. Okay, the high priest would have these... 12 stones on his breastplate, uh, uh, you know, representing all the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, now uh, let's just uh, go a little deeper and see what the word has to say. So there was a veil that separated the inner court, which is the holy place, from the holy of holies, also known as the most holy place. The holy of holies contained the mercy seat and the ark of testimony. Okay, this is very important for us to know. The Holy of Holies was not empty. Okay, it's very, very important for us to know that the Holy of Holies was not empty. That place had the Ark of Testimony in it. All right, um, so can I quickly uh, request someone to read this passage, please? Anybody, please. The whole passage? Yes. The Exodus 1, is it right? right? Yes. Exodus 26, okay. 30 to 34. Yeah, okay. this one. Thank you. Thank you. And you shall uh, raise up, rise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown 
on the mountain. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of turban. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of Akaya wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from Tal's then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there before the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. Thank you, Dave. Right. Um, right. That's uh, that's another passage for us to you you know you can read again uh, a little later on um where is that sorry there's another passage of scripture that i've mentioned in exodus 25 you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark and in the ark you shall put the testimony that i will give you once again and there i will meet with you i will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. Okay. Um, what really uh, fascinates me about this is when God starts the design of the tabernacle, when he starts, starts telling Moses about the design and how it should be, when we talk about the tabernacle, we start from the outside. We start from the gate. We start from the outer courts, inner courts, and the most holy place. But God always started from the holy place and then went outside. That again, you know, should tell something about uh, the way God functions and God thinks and God works is that uh, for him, the inside is more important than the outside. Right? That's not to say that the outside is less important or anything, but if he's starting from the, uh, from the holy place, holy of holies, and then he works his way out, and that should tell us something. That means it is very important, right? Um, so that's just a little bit about, uh, you know, just some of the pointers that I want to share about the Ark. Because like I mentioned, uh, the Holy of Holies was not empty, right? It, it had a piece of furniture in it, okay? So uh, in the Bible, right, um, there are a few Arks that is mentioned. Okay, it is uh, uh, now in the Old Testament itself, the Ark of the Covenant is, uh, depending on the translations that you use, it's mentioned at least 185 times. Okay, 185 times. All right, so um, I'll just put this uh, something that I. Uh, so the Hebrew word for Ark. A chat for us. Okay, uh, the Hebrew word for ark is tava. Okay, T A hyphen V A or tevet. It's not in your notes. I'm just just additional notes that I'm sharing with you. Okay, so um, the word tava. Okay, uh, is used twice in the Bible. Not only uh, it. Now one of the first ark that was uh, that is mentioned in the Bible is the Noah's ark. Right, um, it's uh, in the and we see that in Genesis chapter six to and Genesis nine. I'll I'll share that scripture for you with you all as well. So you can, between, I mean, you all know where Noah's ark is mentioned in the Bible. It's, okay, in Genesis. So that's the, one of the first ark that's mentioned. Now, when you read through that ark and the and the, again the details on how God tells Noah to build it, you know the measurement and everything. Uh, he tells Noah, okay, use pitch or tar to cover it from the outside and on the inside, okay? They call it pitch, like, like a, it'll be like tar, right? Um, and uh, another second arc that is used, uh, that's mentioned in the Bible is, um, again, in the KJV version, if you read Exodus chapter two, just chapter two or three to six, it talks about how Moses's mother, uh, you know, built this small uh, 
basket which was which is also known called as an ark okay that was also pitched with a uh, used tar to pitch inside and out okay uh, and and also the third mention of the ark is used in term uh, is used in terms of um, in jo when they had to bury joseph okay uh, again depending on the translation in genesis 50 verse 26 that's genesis chapter 50 verse 26 okay uh, the word that's used there for coffin for joseph's coffin is actually um, this hebrew word which again means like a chest like a treasury of chest you know like a treasure chest like a big uh, trunk you know that people call it um a tool chest a chest box everything you know which was also the same term used for the ark okay so let's just pause there and you see that ark was actually used to protect yourself to protect yourself from the danger and everything. But also at the same time, it was also used to put away dead things into and, and, and to be put away. And much later we see, right, that the Ark of the Covenant, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant, inside the Ark, uh, there was 10 commandments, the laws that was kept inside. And there was Aaron's rod or staff that was put inside. And, and a manna that was placed inside. And all of those has significance, right? So, uh, uh, and why do, I, why do we need to know about all of this? And I think it's very important that we understand all these, uh, you know, small details. It's uh, not, uh, it's good, isn't it? So, uh, but except, you know, all these arcs was pitched with tar inside and out, except, the Ark of the Covenant of God was pitched on the outside and the inside with gold. It was covered with gold. And that, again, resembles uh, the divinity, the, um, the heavenly things, the royalty, the kingdom, etc. That's what gold resembles, isn't it? And, and also another small thought about acacia wood that God tells them to use. Now, acacia wood in those in their culture uh, is known as an incorruptible wood okay uh, now in the bible again wood uh, is symbolized as humanity okay you there's a lot of imageries like this right that the bible uses metaphorically so wood always symbolized humanity okay uh, now when acacia wood in their culture it was like a wood that was incorruptible and it would this wood would produce a balm or a gum okay that people would use for medicinal purposes for healing purposes you see where i'm going with this uh you know it's like symbolizing beautifully that jesus was this inhuman he was incorruptible and by his stripes by his blood that was shed out of his body we are healed isn't it? Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's just another pointer, you know, for us to uh, remember about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and from there on, you know, we see that, um, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's really it. Um, you know, when, this is a place where you have communion with God. Okay, this is a place where you don't do anything, where you are, where you just come face to face before Him, uh, before this this eternal being, this humongous, this this eternal God, the Ancient of Days, the Holy One of Israel. That is a place of worship. Okay. In the outer courts, guys, just stay with me. In the outer courts, okay, as Psalm 100 says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Okay, in the outer courts, there will be a lot of people. There can be a lot of people, like a group of people, like a, like a crowd, like a 50 or 100. 
Okay. And and from there, when you come into the holy place, it's suddenly small and you can only fit into approximately 10 to 12 people in that place. But in the holy of holies, there's room only for one. So what is happening there is that you can praise God with a crowd in the congregation corporately. You can praise him. You can exalt him. right? And then when you go into the holy place, you can serve God with a group of people, with a team, with a, just a handful. But you can only worship him face to face, one on one. And that is what is happening in the Holy of Holies, right? Um, let us dwell in the Holy of Holies. And this is the place of intimacy with God. This is the place of high intensity, thus the raw presence of God. This is the secret place of the Most High. Amen? One of the things about the secret place is, in the secret place, there are no secrets. It's actually a place of revelation. Right? We call it as a secret place. But when you go into that secret place with him, it becomes a place of revelation where God begins to share the mysteries of his heart, the mysteries of his kingdom, mysteries of his plan, his will for you, for us. Right? Uh, and just on an encouraging note, uh, it is that places like Mary settling down at the feet of Jesus, um, listening to the voice of God. It is choosing that one thing, which is good part, which cannot be taken away. Okay, um, so as as Christians, as um, let me just uh, stop presenting here for a second. Okay. Um, on, on concluding uh, part of this section, as as Christians, as uh, ministers of God, as ministry leaders, wherever you are at, um, we cannot be satisfied in the outer courts. We cannot be satisfied in just knowing, okay, Jesus died for me, all is well, happy life, yay, yay, yay. No. But there is an invitation. Right? There's an invitation. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant was another, again, a symbol of the throne of God on earth. It was his throne here. And Hebrews, we see that he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. He's not only saying come, but God is saying, you know, he's addressing your attitude in the manner how you can come. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't just stay in the outer courts. You know, and there's a beautiful song by Petra. Uh, and I'll share the link. It says, take me past the outer courts into your holy place, uh, past the brazen altar uh, where, we, where we stand face to face. Uh, and it's, it's a lovely song. Uh, it's ministered to me uh, so many times. Um, I'll try and get that link and I'll share it with you. So uh, in conclusion of this session, I uh, want to encourage you all, uh, you know, encourage your team members because you are all going to be ministry leaders eventually. Most of you already are. Um, you know, encourage your team leaders, encourage your congregation, uh, your people, uh, your friends, your worship team members, your youth in your church. Uh, anybody, you know, if you know that, they're just satisfied with knowing Jesus as a savior, which is good. It's a good place to start, but then they have to get all the way into the Holy of Holies. Amen. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll uh, pause the session. I'll stop the recording. We'll take a quick break and uh, we'll come.